errors. To love or not to love? Think of Shakespeare's play Hamlet. Dealing with error logging can be painful. But like Hamlet, you realize that the alternatives would be even worse. If you're new to Go, chances are you get annoyed by the following. Mm. This makes me a little bit angry. Sad, actually, because I love this. In fact, I love this so much, the last time I mentioned this, I was told I might suffer from Stockholm Syndrome. And do you know what I said? Yes, you're right, but for good reasons. This isn't about being repetitive. This is about the statement preceding the error handling itself. It's not about writing the error check over and over again. I mean, do you think the Go language was designed to torture you with something that could be replaced with syntactical sugar? No, every time an error is returned, Go wants you to pause and think, okay, what should happen now? Often you will just keep returning the error and you might be able to do this for a while, but eventually you will reach a point where you cannot pass the error up any further. For example, in a middleware, and you decide to log the error. This way you will be aware of all the errors that are happening in your system, providing you with a great error monitoring system, right? No, wrong. That's a lot to scroll through. If you have a system that is relatively complex, this will get bigger and bigger, producing a noisy error log. In the best case, it takes a lot of time to find errors that are critical to your infrastructure. In the worst case, errors are going to be ignored altogether. Okay, what can we do about this? Some errors pose a real problem and yes, they need to be fixed. Other errors? It depends. Take timeouts, for example. You can optimize your clients and infrastructure to reduce the number of timeouts. But some network conditions are out of your control. Do we really need to log them every time? There is a much better observability tool for this. Metrics. We can use a counter to simply observe timeouts and plot them as a graph. Not only does it make it easier to quantify them, now we can also create alerts based on them. So you use errors as to check if the error matches a specific target. In this case, we want to test for a network error. And if it is in fact a timeout, we increment the counter and don't log it anymore. The issue is, as we add new error types that we don't want to log, the code becomes increasingly entangled. More so, we're not really able to tell which operation had a timeout or where the context was canceled. Instead, you should move these error assertions as close as possible to where they happen. Because the domain that produces the error will have much better capabilities to narrow them down. We move the network error assertion to our Redis client invocation here. Okay, but what do we do after the assertion? Should we log it? We still need to return it here because we don't want to log and return the error. From Dave Cheney, I learned assert errors for behavior. And so this is what I came up with. Logable, an interface for errors that lets the error define whether it wants to be logged or not. It's almost like we're giving errors a voice here. <laughs> for errors we already observed as a metric, we can introduce an observed error type. Observed error 
implements love to always return false. It allows us to wrap the arrow and return it with confidence, knowing that our middleware can now assert the error once and check if the error should be logged or not. It's a small framework to categorize your errors into observed errors that don't need to be logged and errors that should be logged. Creating this can feel tedious in the beginning, but over time, it will thin out your error log, leaving you with the really important errors that you actually want to address. And that's it. Thanks for listening.